So here's my new backpack. Let's have a look at what's inside. It's a Mindshift 26 liter pack. And it's one of these weird ones that actually opens from the back, which in a way is kind of a pain in the ass, but in some other ways is probably good. So here it is. This is my entire setup right at the moment. Let's take these items out and see what they're all about. So here's my entire system right at the moment. Here we have the Sony Alpha 1 as the body. This is a Sigma 24-72.8. Here's the Sony 70-200-2.8. And here's the Sony 200-600. To 600 f5.6 to 6.3 these three lenses plus that body are all that I have so you can see you know, in comparison to my hand this is a pretty small setup and it's one of the major reasons that I went this route and you could tell from that pack that's not really a very big pack this is my entire system all of it no more heavy primes no more truck full of gear just this that you see in front of you. So I tell you what, instead of looking at my ugly face while I talk about this system, let's just look at some of the images I've shot with it instead in sort of a slideshow format uh, while I talk about the various pluses and minuses and reasons behind what I've done. This is my fourth time of completely changing out my overall camera system since I began photographing trains back in the late 1970s. From 1978 to 1980, I shot with a Konica system. In 1980, I wisely switched to Nikon. And remember, this was back in the film era. I stuck with Nikon for almost 20 years, switching to Canon EOS in 1999, which was still during the film era. I migrated to digital in 2002, again keeping the Canon system, but just switching out the bodies from film to digital. And I stayed with Canon until 2012. At which time, interestingly enough, I switched back to Nikon with the D800 family, which is the system that I've been using until just about a week ago, at which point I switched to, of all things, the Sony Alpha series. Now, why did I do this? For one thing, I'm getting old and my vision is rapidly deteriorating. My central vision is such that I can no longer reliably determine whether something's in focus or not by looking at it. And this is not due um, to anything that can be corrected by optics. This is due to degeneration of my retina, so I just simply can't tell if something's in focus or not. So therefore, I have to rely on autofocus, and so I really need an autofocus that actually works. And up until recently, this hasn't been available. The other major concern of mine is that, as I said, I'm getting old and I'm really tired of lugging around an entire truckload of very heavy equipment. I've been shooting most of the time with big fast primes like the 500 f4, 300 28 lenses like that that are large, they're heavy, they're just, quite honestly, a pain in the ass. They do produce excellent results, but they're, it's just too much, and I'm getting too old for that, and I don't like hauling all of that around. So that's why I've switched from the Nikon system, uh, which actually is a fairly abbreviated uh, collection of equipment compared to what I had in my Canon days. I mean, my Canon collection was truly outrageous, as I had a total of five gigantic telephoto primes, two bodies, and then a whole bunch of shorter primes as well that were quite heavy. Uh, my Nikon system only consists of two large primes and then a couple of zooms, but it's still more than I want to carry around. The new Sony system I have is the Alpha 1 and 3 zooms, and that's it. And it gives me all the capability that I've had at any point since the 1970s. I can do more today with just this little Sony system than I've ever been able to accomplish in the past and produce images of superior quality, and I'm quite confident in saying that. One thing I will say about the Sony Alpha 1 is the autofocus is simply unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this. It simply nails the autofocus every time. It's not bothered in the least by headlights or ditch lights. You can move the focus spot anywhere in the frame. It's not like the Nikon where you have focus points that you can move to, but they're all fairly close to the center of the frame. With the Sony, you can move that anywhere. And of course, with the Nikon, every time it got close to a headlight or a ditch light, the focus would go crazy. It would start hunting all over the place. 
None of that happens with the Sony. Furthermore, the focus is just instantaneous. You can't even see it happen. It's just you push the shutter button halfway down and boom, it's magically in focus, just instantly. And even though the Sony is a mirrorless camera, you wouldn't know it. The only way you know it is when the camera is off and you put it up to your eye like you would a, an SLR, you don't see anything because the viewfinder is black because you're not actually looking through the lens. You're looking at an LCD display inside that viewfinder. So then you turn the camera on and now you can't tell that you're not looking through an SLR. And the reason for this is because the display that you're looking at is almost 10 megapixels, this little tiny display, and it has a frame refresh rate, I think of like 120 frames a second or something like that. It might even be 240. It's just outrageously fast. And so perceptually, it looks like you're just looking through an SLR. You can't tell the difference. Literally, you cannot tell. There's no lag whatsoever. And furthermore, the other thing that's really, really cool is there's no blackout while you're shooting. So with an SLR, when you push the button, of course, the mirror flips up and what you're looking at through the viewfinder gets blacked out temporarily while it's making the exposure and then the mirror comes back down and now you can see again. And I think even with some mirrorless cameras, there's still blackout during the, the shooting interval, but not with this one. With this one, you're seeing things the whole time. There's no flicker. There's no interruptions. It's, it's really an amazing experience. The other thing that just blew me away is how small and lightweight this body is. Because I'm used to the D810, which is not gigantic. Uh, back in the Canon days, I was using the EOS 1DS uh, for a long time, which is a very big camera. And even in the film days, I was using Nikon F3s with the motor drive and an iCAD pack. And these are very large, heavy bodies. And this Sony Alpha 1 seems like a little tiny, almost toy to me because it's so small and so lightweight. It's really something. The other thing I'll say is that the zooms are quite nice compared to the primes because they, they're just so much easier to use. You know, the problem with a prime is you get what you get, right? You can't change it. If I go to a location and I pull out my 500 F4 on the Nikon and I set up the shot, guess what? It might be too strong. It might not be strong enough, but there's nothing I can do to change it. If the train comes along and the composition isn't quite right, I'm just screwed because I'm not going to have time to change the lens uh, while the train is there. With the zoom, I can start out at, let's say, 600 millimeters and start shooting. And if I don't like that, I can just literally twist the uh, zoom ring and pull back all the way to 200 and keep shooting along the way and find the composition that I want. I can frame it up exactly the way I want it. So it's so much more flexible. And it really is unbelievable to me how much the technology of zoom lenses has advanced. I would have never believed that zooms were capable of producing the quality that this one can produce. Another thing about this body is it can shoot 30 frames per second. Now, I don't know why you'd need to do that for trains, for sports and for wildlife, maybe, but for trains, I, I don't see a use for it, but it's interesting that it can do that. The sensor is claimed to have a 15 stop dynamic range, which is better than anything I've ever seen in terms of digital performance. And another thing that's really interesting is that with the Sony system, you have in-body image stabilization, and you also have stabilization in the lenses, and the two are coupled together and combined. And it's actually quite remarkable that you can handhold that 200 to 600 zoom at 600 millimeters, even as old and shaky as I am, I can handhold that and get sharp shots. Now that said, I don't do that. I do use it on a tripod because I think that's a lot better. But anybody who's used a very long telephoto lens knows that even on a tripod, especially with wind and just the vibration of ground due to passing traffic or whatever, you still see a fair amount of vibration. But with the stabilization, that's all just completely eliminated. I'll also say that the Alpha 1 is very intuitive and easy to use. I didn't read the instruction manual. I didn't really have to do anything. I just picked it up, turned it on, started playing with the controls, and was pretty comfortable with it within just a few minutes. Another thing I'll say is that the viewfinder is interesting. You can't get diopter eyepieces. I have extremely poor vision, and on my Nikon, I have a minus 4 diopter that's added to the adjustable diopter on the viewfinder. On the Sony, you can't actually get those. Um, it does have some adjustment on the, the viewfinder itself, but it's only like plus or minus two, so it's not enough for me. But here's the thing. It's designed in such a way that you can actually wear your normal eyeglasses, which correct your vision, and you can look into the viewfinder and see the entire viewfinder. So that's really nice. I don't like having to wear my glasses, but at least I can wear my glasses, which correct my vision to the best capability that's possible, and I can still see into the viewfinder and see clearly. On the downside, there's only two real negatives here that I can see. The first is that the camera body is quite expensive, although it's that said, it's not the most expensive body I've ever purchased. And by the way, I purchased all of this equipment used except for the Sigma. And the reason I didn't get it used is I didn't see one uh, available at the time, and I would have only saved about a hundred bucks in doing so. So I just bought that one new. But the other two zooms and the body itself, I got used. So I saved a little bit of money there. 
the most expensive camera body I ever bought was the Canon EOS 1DS for $8,000 back in 2002. And keep in mind, that was money of 20 years ago. So, you know, what's $8,000 in 2002 money worth today? Quite a little bit. The other negative is it really chews through batteries. I mean, you need lots of batteries because on a typical outing of a day where I'm shooting all day long, it'll probably go through a fully charged battery. And the batteries are really no more impressive than those of like the Nikon. They're only something like 2000 milliamp. But then again, the batteries are relatively cheap and they're not that big. So I just carry three charged batteries with me and I don't worry about it. So that's basically an overview of what I've done and why I've done it. So hopefully you find that useful.